let me in, invite you to ask some questions or raise some topics for discussion. Who would like to begin? Yes? About the, uh, the walking meditation where you divide the three parts into three, you see the nine parts? Yeah. Are they all equally spaced or is that just a matter of awareness I mean should it should it be on equal pace over all nine parts or not necessarily or not necessarily it's what what uh, works best for you yeah. and the way I do it they're not really e- equally spaced some of them are a little bit longer and, and, and involve more and so. so it's just uh, the idea is that you'll you'll just discover where uh, your mind naturally finds it easiest to differentiate three different parts, and that's that's your beginning, middle, and end uh, <laughs> for that. How did you? How did you? Did you you tried that walking meditation <coughs> for a little yeah. bit. I found that the setting my foot down was much slower, more deliberate than the other part, or. That I was rushing through the picking up the foot and swinging and swinging mm-hmm. the leg. To, mm-hmm. yeah. So, well, as, uh, it, it's interesting to notice those kinds of things as they happen and, and see if they, uh, if there's any sort of insight or understanding that comes from that. But as you continue doing it, you'll you'll just naturally come into a, a fairly smooth flow. Of it. Did you find it uh, uh, did you find the process of doing it uh, something that uh, uh, was useful helpful to you or? yeah I did because it, it, it gives you something to it gives you something to anchor on rather than mm-hmm. just walking or even trying to walk slow or yeah um, I also found that just like with every other object once I started to get used to it that it was easy for it to fade in, into the background and yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, when it right. when it was new this morning, it was, mm-hmm. it was right. all fun and exciting. And later this afternoon, it was like, yeah. Yeah. you know, we're just walking. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yes. Once you get familiar with this division into three and three and three, then that can become uh, easy to let it slip into the background. When you start putting together those distinctive sensations that make it up, that that should keep you focused for quite a while. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that helped. And um, I didn't find that there was much difference with shoes on. I imagine the head I'd done it, I didn't do it barefoot at all, mm-hmm. but doing it barefoot would be fairly dramatic. Yes. Between yeah. between all the parts, but I, yeah, you know, yeah. even with shoes, it was, yeah. you know. Yes, uh, uh, and uh, there's there's different uh, things that you discover doing with and without shoes. And actually, my preference is uh, to do it with sandals, because the sandal falls away from the sole of your foot when you raise it, and you, know, you can feel the sensation of the air moving, which you also feel when you're barefoot, but you don't when you have shoes on, and things like that. So, okay. But you can do it with with any state of footwear you can imagine. (laughs) Is that a practice that you're meant to do every day? Uh, It's more... uh, It's actually more suited to doing in a retreat setting where you're working, where you're getting into deeper and deeper states of concentration. And this practice helps to balance that out with with more and more intense and vivid mindful awareness. But in your daily practice, uh, you, you're always free to, you know, when you have a, a collection of different techniques, like different tools you can use, then you're free to choose the ones on any particular day or occasion that uh, seem to to suit your mental state and the other factors, maybe the, the things that you <coughs> feel like you need to accomplish. And I, I do encourage you to do some walking meditation every day. Um, usually, you know, I, I, it's a large enough challenge to find uh, the time to sit every day. But very often there, there's an opportunity to uh, at, at least if you're willing to uh, 
take advantage of it. There's an opportunity to do uh, 10 or 15 or 20 minutes of walking meditation sometime or another during the day. Um, even uh, on a street, a sidewalk, or, or in a park or something like that. Uh, just for the sake of not feeling too goofy, you might want to do a, a faster form of walking meditation <laughs> part of your daily practice. And doing that kind of merges into trying to remember to practice mindful awareness as much as you can all of the time during the day. And also taking advantage of all kinds of opportunities to uh, just practice concentrating on your breath. You know, you, you dial a phone and you get put on hold. Well, you know, you can meditate <coughs> on your breath. You're waiting in a, in a uh, lineup for a checkout. You're sitting at a red, red light in your car. You know, it's, uh, you don't need to spend that time thinking about the same old stuff you always think about. As a matter of fact, you're probably better off not. You can see if you can use those little moments that come up to see if you can come into that place of, uh, of uh, calm and uh, concentration. So, so, yeah. Do try to do some walking as often as you can, walking meditation. Uh, Walking is good exercise, and uh, some people do walking or jogging as a as a part of their daily exercise routine. Well, as long as you're already out there in some suitable place anyway, you just take ten minutes of that time and do some walking practice. So yeah. um, the the walking meditation where you're not doing breaking it into nine parts. There, you're just trying to focus on the sensation in your feet. Is that right? Yes, you're using the sensations in your feet. Uh, as, as as an anchor for your attention, and you're just practicing directing and sustaining your attention. It's not you know it's not so rigid or rigorous as your sitting practice of observing the breath, uh, and so therefore it's quite relaxed. And uh, you know you can, uh, as a matter of fact, when you when you've been sitting for a long time and you might feel that you that this is sort of a, a, a need for a break from all this concentration. You can do that walking meditation as a way that's still practicing, but it's just uh, not so intense. Yeah, a little bit more relaxed, a little easier. Mm -hmm. Yes? Can you elaborate on what you said last night about uh, not being single pointed until the very end. Yes. Uh, <coughs> one of the reasons uh, that uh, I found uh, seems to be with you know there's a lot of people who've been practicing meditation literally for years and they can't keep their mind from wandering. They can't stay with a meditation object for the whole period of a sit. And a lot of them, when I talked to them, you know, uh, I discovered that. They felt like they were supposed to uh, not only pay attention to the meditation object, but at the same time exclude everything else. And it works much better if you just let the let all the other stuff be and worry about dealing with that later on after you've mastered being able to stay with the. Uh, first of all, you master being able to stay with your meditation object so that you never really lose it, even though sometimes it slips off into the periphery and you're paying more attention to some thought, you never really lose it, then you go through a stage where you become very skilled at not ever letting it slip off into the periphery, not ever letting <coughs> anything else displace it. Then you're ready. Once once you can do that, once you can you know, typically uh, over and over again sit down, close your eyes, focus your attention on your breath, and keep that as your primary focus every time you sit, then you're ready to concern yourself with being single-pointed and with eliminating all of these other things. Um, trying to do it too soon is a, is a serious uh, uh, obstacle. You try to do too much, you expect too much, uh, and then you end up frustrated and disappointed. And, and Nice, nice, easy, manageable steps. That's that's the way to proceed. And 
I think I might have said this yesterday, or I'm sure Keldon has, the the most difficult steps are those those first few of getting over the tendency to uh, allow something else to take your attention away and you forget the meditation object and your mind wanders. And it just gets easier and easier after that. So until you've achieved that, then that's all you need to be concerned with. <laughs> And, and, and that helps to create a relaxed atmosphere in your practice, you know. You're not sitting down to try to do the impossible. You're sitting down to do something that is, is relatively straightforward and easy. Um, we have this illusion that we do things, that we have control over things. And uh, our stream of consciousness as doer is very, very limited in what it can actually do. It is pretty much limited to this single thing of generating particular kinds of intentions. You know? Uh, and after that, everything else that happens, uh, whatever takes place, is the result of these many different mental processes, these many different mental functions working uh, simultaneously, uh, semi-autonomously, and sometimes in concert and sometimes in opposition to each other. So what we do through our, we recognize what we're capable of doing, setting certain intentions and then allowing those intentions to manifest and follow through. And then as a result of that, we get the, the kind of, we, we achieve the kind of result end result that we're after and I, I find it really useful to make a comparison between this early process of the meditation and learning to throw darts so first of all um, all you need to do in the early stage is uh, direct your attention to the meditation object do your best to engage then whatever happens, if your mind wanders, you realize it, then you, you provide some positive reinforcement for that unconscious mental process that led to you waking up to the moment. You didn't make it happen, and you can't make it happen. And the same thing with the forgetting and the mind wandering. You didn't make that happen, and you can't stop it from happening. These are mental processes that are just <coughs> manifesting as they always do. And so the forgetting and the mind wandering <coughs> occurs. It happens. You don't do it. You can't blame yourself for it happening. The waking up to the realization that your mind has wandered uh, and, and being aware that this, you know, you're intending to meditate, this is also not something that you do. It's not something you make happen. You can't, you can't stop the tendency to mind wander by punishing yourself. It just, it will not work. But you can, through positive reinforcement, make the recognition that the mind wandering has occurred happen more rapidly and more frequently so that you stop the mind wandering sooner. And you do that by appreciating it, by appreciating that realization and by valuing that waking up to the present moment that will have the effect of conditioning those unconscious mental processes that make it happen to make it happen more often. Right? And so that's why you just keep repeating that. You just All you have to do, it's a, meditation is so easy, you just sit down and whenever your mind wanders and you realize it, feel good about realizing it and bring your attention back. <laughs> and after a while, just by repeating this enough, you know, you're, you're, it, it takes longer for your mind to wander and it comes back quicker. And uh, when I compare that with, with the way you play darts, you know, so you're going to learn to throw darts for the very first time, and somebody puts this target with all these circuits way on the other side of the room and gives you a handful of darts and says, okay. Well, all you can do is formulate the intention to hit the target <laughs> and throw the dart. And at start off with, they miss. But if you keep doing that, you just every, you, know, you have the intention to hit the target and you throw it, there's really nothing else that you can do, is there? 
They just keep doing it, and after a while, they start hitting the target. And that's exactly the way the meditation is. You just do these simple things that you can do, that are easy for you to do, uh, until it starts producing the result that you want. And you should do it in the same, uh, uh, you know, presumably if you were going to learn to throw darts, it it would be because it, it seems kind of fun. It is kind of fun to keep throwing the darts and see that, you know, uh, as long as as long as you can laugh about it when you miss, <laughs> as long as you don't get upset about it when you miss, and you just keep on throwing them, you will get better. And at some point, you start to feel, oh, well, I, I actually hit the target, and eventually, ah, oh, I actually hit the bullseye. Right? Isn't that how it happens? It's the same thing with meditation. You want to approach it the same way. That this is, you know, I'm just training my mind. This is a fun thing to do. And if I just keep <coughs> following the instructions, you know, eventually I'm going to get good at this. Yes. In observing a sensation, um, it's recurrent for me that uh, I experience uh, like uh, currents, currents of energy. Yes. Uh, that pulse uh, in predominantly more certain areas more than others. Mm-hmm. So in working in expanding um, the experience of the sensation out, um, well, Keldon always, when he presents a body scan, mm-hmm. he starts with the feet and moves up. And I, I, I'm quite sure I've heard him say more than once that it doesn't have to be in this order. It's just mm-hmm. a, a predecided order. I there's no question out of habituation. I'm strongly uh, have a natural sense to um, almost like extend the flow mm-hmm. from from completely the opposite, mm-hmm. flushing mm-hmm. down right. because the the currents are so strong yeah. in certain. Is is there anything a comment about it? You know the. The direction? No, the direction is not. It's it's not really important uh, in for any particular individual. There may be some direction, like the when we talked earlier. There obviously was with you. Were all you were already experiencing the tendency of uh, of wanting to expand your awareness from your nose to your chest to your abdomen and so forth, and so go with that. There's nothing special, as, as Keldon told you, there's nothing special about that at all. Um, but each approach will provide you with certain particular kinds of, of things that you can discover as a basis of it. Like, um, if you start out doing your body scan uh, with your hands or your feet, and very often that's the way I, I teach it, to start with that, then you will explore those sensations there and you're looking for some sensation that changes with the breath and uh, you most likely won't find any. And then as you move more uh, closer and closer to the the trunk, the abdomen, then there will come a point where indeed there are sensations there that you can discern. And so if this is your first experience, then later on as you start to realize that you're becoming aware of uh, more and more often you're becoming aware of sensations that change with the breath that are farther away from the source of the movement, then uh, this is a kind of very positive, rewarding experience. Uh, it also, because when you first do it, uh, the first sensations that you'll usually be able to feel, for example, you might do your arms, and the first sensation you can feel is that as your chest moves, there's a little bit of change in, in pressure against the inside of your arm. And that's still due to actual physical movement. But then later on, when you start to feel something that is in your forearm, you're really aware that, that isn't movement. You right away know, ah, I'm actually feeling this prana that they talk about. You know, And I'll tell you my own experience of this, too, is that uh, I, I had heard all about chi and chakras and prana and everything else. And 
I became interested and in, involved in Buddhism when I was a graduate student doing my PhD in physiology. And to me, all of that sounded like a lot of overblown imagination. <laughs> a lot of hooey. But in the process of doing my meditation practice, when I started doing that particular practice, I discovered that this chi, this prana, these chakras, these winds, that, hey, th- there's something real. All of these traditions they have their own different ways of describing it, but they're all talking about something that is very, very real. And of course, now it's so familiar to me, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but to me, it was so amazing the first time I realized that I was feeling something that had absolutely nothing to do with, you know, sensations produced by the actual sense organs of my body, that I was sensing something that was of a completely different nature. And so one of the things that I I, I think that, uh, well, I like, I, I think the reason that I like to encourage people to start with the hands and feet is I, I love to have them have that same experience. I've, they've already gotten familiar with physical sensations and then when the day comes that they realize that they're experiencing something that is no longer purely physical, then then it's, it's, it's a really wonderful experience for them. But back to your original question, it makes absolutely no difference at all where you begin, how you go, you know, whether you uh, you can proceed from your your foot to your ankle to your to your leg to your thigh to your buttocks, or you can go from one foot to the other foot and then the other uh, ankle and, and and the opposite ankle and any any direction any pattern any way you want to do it uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, also, uh, there are uh, some people are naturally inclined to you know that. Uh, they may start out in one area of their body, but they very quick, instead of methodically going, you know, one arm, the other arm, one leg, the other leg, things like that, they start out in one area of the body and then very quickly they expand to the whole body, you know, and they just, they're not inclined to do this methodical one part at a time, and so they just go right ahead. And that's fine, whatever, whatever works for you. As long as, as long as you're, uh, attention is being directed and sustained intentionally, and as long as the process is one of, of intensifying your awareness of sensations, uh, first in in one area, uh, then in another, first in a small area, then in a larger area. That's the most important thing: is that you are enhancing the power of your mindful awareness and you are exercising your ability to direct and sustain attention. So as long as you're doing that, the sequence is an important. I have a <clears throat> question. I did so well in my meditations this morning. I mean, I felt that I was able to really stay on, <clears throat> stay on the uh, breath and and I was thought I was really making some progress, and then this afternoon when I came in, um, it, there was I just didn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, my my uh, something in me just said I I'd done this enough. <laughs> I did it all morning. I, I didn't know really how to work with that because it was so strong. It's like, and then when I would sit there and try to focus on my breath, and um, I think a lot of a dullness and un. Uh, Disconnected thoughts floating through, not even about anything, you know, just like mm-hmm. different voices and stuff that would, didn't seem to have any, any anything mm-hmm. to it. But yeah. I, I really couldn't. It was like there was a negative influence that just said, I'm tired of this. Right. I don't want to do it anymore. Right. Yes. And I... I 
Thank you, Allegra. That's that's a very good thing to bring up and, and so that we can address. In fact, that feeling is uh, it, it's really no different than any other distraction uh, or emotion or thought. But we don't recognize that. We we don't uh, we don't recognize that. And if we don't recognize that, then we identify it instead of objectifying it, and then we spend our time fighting against it, basically banging our head against the wall, instead of uh, uh, taking it, what we should be doing is taking it as, as a new meditation object. You, know, mm-hmm. um, you deal with it in exactly the same way you do what you would a physical pain in your body, or a powerful memory that's disturbing, or an emotion that arises, uh, some disturbing thought or something like that. You, you deal with it in the same way. And we didn't talk about dealing with pain. Did anybody have any pain on sitting today? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> a, a few people? A lot of people? I had a stomachache after yeah. lunch, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, I ate too much. <laughs> well, I'm going to speak uh, generally about how you deal with these kinds of distractions. Um, thank you very much, Bradford. That's very good. Um, but first of all, I, I want. I want you to be able to see, you and I want everybody to be able to see, how this feeling of restlessness, impatience, I don't really want to do this today, is the same as all of these other distractions. Okay? Every emotion that you experience, uh, fear, anger, annoyance, happiness, whatever it is, it's produced by your mind. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Your mind creates it. Your mind could have created a different emotion, but your mind happened to create this one now. Um, And what you need to understand is that, you know, you can't you can't work with that in an effective way. You can't penetrate into it. You can't, you can't really transcend it as long as you identify with it. As long as, I'm so annoyed. I'm so happy. I just feel so restless. I don't really want to do this. As long as it's I, as long as you identify with it, you're not going to be able to get very far with it. You're in in that you're you're feeding it. You're just you're giving it all the nourishment that it needs to be really strong and just stay there and and be there, right? So, if you can recognize that all of these feelings and every thought that comes with it has been generated by your mind, it came into being due to mental processes. Mental processes that you're not consciously aware of, that you can't see. Uh, But they're chugging away, turning away somewhere in the background, and this is their product, and you get to experience it. Same thing when a memory comes up. That memory is, you know, your mind's had that memory since ever since the event happened. Why did it decide to bring it up now? There's some, some processes taking place that you can't tap into, and you don't need to tap into, and you don't want to tap into. You just recognize that that I am, I am not my mind, I am not my feelings, I am not my thoughts. But rather, the mind is this vast collection of different processes, and it generates thoughts and memories and feelings and things like that. The particular thoughts and feelings that it generates at any given time 
are produced as a result of the mind's own logic and the mind's own inner working based on how you have conditioned your mind in the past and based on the experiences you've accumulated and and based on the kind of data that you have fed into your mind stream uh, in the last 10 minutes, the last hour, the last day, and so forth. Now, you, there's not a whole lot that you can do with it. It's a it's a product. It's an end result. It's already it's already happened and it's over with. And there you are, feeling like I don't want to do this. Now, the thing to do is just to recognize that I am not this thought or this feeling, but that it is arising. It's more like. Oh, my mind is producing this emotion. I mean, you don't have to have that kind of discursive thought, but you certainly want to have that kind of awareness, that objectivity. As soon as you create that kind of space between the sense of selfhood and the uh, and whatever it is that's happened to come up, then you can now you're free to take that as an object in the same way you do the sensations of the breath. You don't create the sensations of the breath. The body breathes all by itself, and the sensations arise as a result of that breathing, right? And if you can see the emotions and thoughts and so forth in the same way, that you don't create them, but they happen in the same way that your body breathes and the sensations are the result of that, your mind functions and emotions and thoughts are the result of that. Now, let's generalize this. There, you know, there are all of those different things that come up that take our attention away from the meditation. They're, they're very strong. They take the attention away from the meditation very effectively. And no matter how many times we bring it back, they keep taking the attention away. And a very good example of that is pain in the body that occurs with sitting. And a lot of you experience that today. Uh, our bodies, when we sit still for a long period of time, develop particular discomforts. For one person, it's really in the, in, in the knee. It starts out in this knee, and then later on it's this knee and this hip, and then later on it's the knee and the hip and the shoulder. And that's their particular pattern. You know, and somebody else, it, it's something different. You know, maybe their neck, maybe their ankle, or so on. But when we sit still, we have pain. And at some point, you're trying to uh, you're, you're trying to attend to the sensations of your breath, but you have this pain in your knee that is just so strong it's taking your attention away. When that happens, the proper thing to do is to let go of the breath as an object and take the pain in the knee as an object. As a matter of fact, this is the only way that you can really continue your practice. You know, uh, when when you can no longer successfully direct and sustain your attention on on the breath because there's something else that is strongly intruding, instead of fighting against it, you you do a little trick. You you do a little mental uh, 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 jujitsu, and you say, okay. I'm going to make that my meditation object. And so you take the pain as a meditation object. Or you take the, the uh, uh, emotions or the memories or the feelings. And this includes things like the feeling of restlessness, or I don't really want to do this, or, or doubt, or whatever it is. That if that's what's there and it keeps coming back and you can't stay with the meditation object, make it your new meditation object. Now how you do that well, physical things always seem to, you know, we can, we can wrap our minds around them and understand uh, things that involve at the physical level a little bit easier than the mental. So we'll go back to pain as the example. If you have a pain in your knee, you take it as a meditation object. Now how you do that is you, you try to get away from uh, thoughts like, oh, my knee hurts. Oh, I am in pain. Oh, I wish it would stop. Okay, you know, see, these are 
These are those thoughts that identify with it. And you try to get into that place of separating yourself from it so that you're going to examine that pain objectively. Okay, and focus on that pain. Exactly where is it? How big is it? Uh, is it moving around? Is it expanding? Is it contracting? Is it alternately expanding and contracting? Sometimes the pain uh, is, is doing those things. Sometimes you'll have a kind of pain that just seems to, it's, it's frozen, it's solid and locked. Okay, and so that's the way it is. So you can investigate its, its shape, its size, its distribution, its movement, how it changes. You can also investigate its qualities. Is this a sharp pain? Is this an aching pain? Is it a throbbing pain? You, know. you can investigate the actual qualities of the pain. Then you can start to go into the sensation more and say, okay, there's a number of sensations here. Are they all pain? And, and, and what is the sensation that I label as pain? And how is it different from any of these others? Um, so you can, you can objectify the pain and investigate it with a great deal of, of detail. Uh, you can even go beyond that and, and go to, to the level of uh, our interpretation of the sensation and ask yourself exactly what is there about this collection of sensations that uh, makes it painful? What is there in there that, that makes it painful? So these are just some e examples, but do you see the idea is you're investigating it objectively and uh, I'm going through, I, I, I went through a lot of different ways that you can investigate it. But remember, it's the same kind of investigation as the breath. Okay, there's the in-breath and the out-breath. Okay, there's the beginning and the middle and the end of the in-breath and the out-breath. Well, there's the pause between the in and the out and the out and the in. There's these sensations that make it up. So you don't necessarily have to go through the whole sequence. You just, you investigate it, you watch it. You just get into that space of objectively observing it. And you go through as many or as few of these ways of investigating it as, uh, as I described, as is necessary just to keep you in that place of investigating. Um, very often what happens is that after a short time of doing this, the pain, sometimes it disappears entirely, just it's gone. Other times it fades and it becomes less painful. Sometimes it just becomes a collection of sensations and you know it's not that painful. Whenever any of those things happen, then as soon as you feel like you could successfully ignore the, the pain or the sensations at the level they're at, then you go back to doing your meditation on the breath. If, if the pain increases again in its intensity and its power to distract you, you go back to it. And so that's the way you meditate when there's a pain. You do the same thing when there's any kind of um, thought process that you're fixated on. So, you know, uh, often we sit down to meditate and we have some very powerful emotional thing going in our lives and we can't, you know, I mean, those thoughts just keep coming up. Now, the thing about thoughts is it, it's so easy to get lost in the thoughts. So, uh, but the thoughts are accompanied by emotions and the emotions are accompanied by bodily feelings. So you can approach it in the same way. Bodily sensations are always going to be the easiest thing for you to focus on and deal with first. So whatever you're experiencing, go to the bodily sensations first. So. If it's an emotional thing, whether it involves thoughts or whatever it involves, how is this making you feel in your body? Settle your attention into your body while you're experiencing this emotion. And, you know, 
does uh, does it make you feel like there's a weight on your chest? Does it give you a feeling of tightness in your throat? Do you feel tension in your forehead? What is it that it, you know? What what physical sensations accompany it? That's the easiest thing to get into, and then you can move from that to the realm of the of the uh, experiential mental part of the emotion. You know, and the same way with the with the pain. Uh, what is it that makes it what it is, and is it getting, is is it increasing intensity, decreasing in intensity? What you'll find with emotions, they actually have a cycle. They get more intense, and then they kind of fade away, and then they come back. And so you can begin to see that. You know, you you don't need to be caught up. But you can't afford to be caught up in, in oh, I feel this, but now you're just observing. I'm feel, you know. I'm experiencing this more intensely now, and now it's fading. And, and whenever it fades, if it, uh, if, if it fades and you say to yourself, well, nothing keeping me from going back to the breath, go back to the breath. Maybe only for a few minutes before it comes back again. But So if you recognize that Restlessness and, and not wanting to practice are just another fabrication of your mind. They're just another mental state that's been produced due to causes and conditions. Now, sometimes you'll be aware of those causes and conditions. Uh, just as with a lot of the emotions that come up in meditation, they're associated with events and memories or thoughts or uh, Views, you know, certain emotions are associated with uh, the way we think of ourselves, our, our image of ourself. And so, when certain kinds of emotions come up in your meditation, what you might find is that that also also brings up some of the causes of that emotion in terms of your your self-image and your views and so forth. In the same way, uh, you know. In the process of ob- objectively examining something uh, like what you've discussed, if you if you take it as a meditation object and examine it objectively, this also gives it a chance to reveal itself. And you know, what are what are the because it has causes. There are your your mind is above all your mind is logical. You know, it has its own. You may not know the basis for the logic it's operating on, and you may not know the particular information, the particular data that it's processing to lead it to the particular thing that it's doing in the moment. But it is going to be very logical. And sometimes those will emerge for you, and if they do, they reveal themselves. Then this gives you a really good opportunity to expose them to the power of your mindful awareness, uh, see them for what they are, and uh, perhaps let go of them. Just, you know, uh, this might free you of them. I knew it was, they were negative thoughts, I knew they were negative thoughts, Mm -hmm. but the other part that came with it, which is, is probably something that has happened many times in meditation. Oh, I'm just wasting my time now here because I'm yeah. not watching my breath. Yeah. And nothing is happening, so I might as well just get up and... Go do something more useful. Go yeah. do something more <laughs> <laughs> If I wasn't here, you know, mm-hmm. with the group, you know, that's yeah. what I would do at home. <laughs> yeah. Well, the wonderful thing about being on a retreat and, and with a group is it does keep you from getting up. But it's not that helpful unless you can remember uh, what I've said here. Absolutely anything, there is nothing at all that will come up physically or mentally while you're sitting that can't be regarded as just another distraction. And if it's a strong enough distraction, take it as your meditation object. That's very helpful. Yeah. Dissociate from it. Actually. That that's right. Make make that uh, enter into that state of objective observation. Uh, you know the we can produce intentions, and the other thing that we can do is observe 
And so uh, the more you can bring yourself, no matter what comes up, into that state of being the objective observer uh, who is simply using intention to direct your attention, then no matter what it is, it's going to turn into a fantastic meditation. <laughs> you had a question? Yeah. Mm, in, the, in the West Coast, I don't have any problems because the, the air is so dry. But when I'm on the East Coast, it's <coughs> a lot of allergies and and I'm, I'm like always sneezing. So when I try to do this meditation and I focus on the tip of the nose, I end up driving myself crazy. This is one of my biggest obstacles, actually. So, and I struggle to yeah. not change it. And then I remember uh, Brian said that you can focus on your abdomen as mm-hmm. well. But I found that that was really, really hard. So I wonder if you can give me some tips because, it, you know, it's, it's here, it's, it's an outer sensation. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I mean, I'm pretty accustomed to try to focus there, even in other types of meditation, you always start there. So it's, yeah. you know, it's kind of normal. Um, but like the abdomen is, you know, like I, I try to focus and then, you know, as my abdomen comes in and out, just the movement of it, but I don't know if there's anything else. Okay, yes, that, that uh, deserves a little bit of explanation. And you're doing the right thing. It, anytime, I mean, even people don't have allergies. Sometimes we have a, have a cold or something like that and we can't breathe through our nose, and that's a good time. Now, when we say the rise and fall of the abdomen as a meditation object, there are, as uh, as you realize, I'm sure, a huge number of sensations present in every part of your body all of the time. And so there are a lot of sensations in your abdomen. Specifically, what you want to do is focus your attention on an area just above your navel. This My, my button sitting over my navel. So this area right in here. I mean, the size of it is not important. It could be this big or this big or whatever. And it's more or less the the uh, s- the skin and the muscles of the abdomen, the, you know, the more superficial aspect of the abdomen. So what you will experience at the beginning of the in-breath, first there will be a sense of pressure and then a sense of stretching as the abdominal wall begins to move and then sensations that are related to the contact of the skin <coughs> uh, with your clothes. And then, a- and so you'll feel that movement. And then at the end of the in-breath, the movement stops and the <coughs> sensations change and there's a pause. And then you feel, uh, once again, as the abdomen begins to fall, the sensations that you're observing are those that occur uh, due to the subtle change in contact between your clothing and your skin and the feeling of the sort of elastic recoil as as your abdominal wall, uh, as the pressure subsides and your abdominal wall falls. So you're not trying to feel your whole abdomen. You're not trying to visualize some balloon expanding and contracting. You're just taking an area like this. And, and, and actually, if for you it's only the skin, that's all right. But uh, you, you want, really you're just trying to uh, identify a set of sensations that are very clearly related to the breath and very easily discernible <coughs> and that you can fairly easily focus on uh, a, 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 as a more or less distinct object. So does that help? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so then in, in this way, if you're just taking this area of the surface, you'll find it is a lot like observing the sensations at the tip of the nose. It's very, very similar. It's the, the sensations are cruder, mm-hmm. <laughs> are coarser. You know, in some ways, it's good. It's a lot easier to discern them, but also uh, they lack some of the subtlety, especially when the breath becomes fine mm-hmm. and, and very shallow. But that's how you use the uh, abdomen as an object, and um, yeah, everyone. You'll have some occasion when you can't breathe easily through your nose, and you'll have to use that. So, yeah. Um, speaking of the breath getting fine, sometimes mine gets so fine that I don't have any physical mm-hmm. sensation. Yes. And so, mm-hmm. uh, would you recommend, like, so I'm going with a mental image of what it would be like if I could feel it, uh, or should I manipulate the breath to 
to make it more coarse. Well, no, don't deliberately change the breath to make it more coarse. Um, when your breath becomes very, very fine, um, I would encourage you, first of all, to keep trying to identify the breath. When your breath is very, very fine, you will also, every now and then, involuntarily, take a deeper breath. Right? That happens with you? And of course, when that happens, you can discern those sensations very clearly. So then you try to, in the next breath, and the next breath, and the next breath, continue to observe the sensations even as they become fainter. Um, You can, as the uh, power of your mindful awareness increases, you can begin to detect, detect very, very subtle sensations. So the subtlest sensations that are produced by the breath can then become apparent. Uh, and sometimes what will happen is when the breath is not so fine that it's almost invisible, you find the sensations are, you're so acutely aware of them, they're almost painful. You know, but, um, so I'm saying that one solution to this is to work on just increasing the power of your mindful awareness. Uh, You can use uh, uh, this uh, meditation of sensations in larger areas of the body to help you, bring you to that. So, for example, if you're having a really long period where your breath is so fine that you just can't find it at all, you might be able to find some sensations of the breath in the chest and the abdomen. And so just expand the area of awareness that you're focusing on to be large enough that whatever sensations are there that you're able to capture them. And then uh, try to perceive them as clearly as you can and see if that doesn't increase the, the sensitivity of your awareness. And if it does, see if you can go back to just the nostrils and still continue to be aware of it. The other thing is that sometimes it's just you, you have the experience that the breath becomes very fine and sometimes you, you, there's several breaths where you can't find it. And, and, and then it's back again for a little while. And then there's a few breaths where you can't really perceive it. And you don't really need to worry about that at all. All you do is uh, usually that only happens when your concentration is really good and your mind is really calm and you're really focused. So you can just stay focused on the area at the tip of your nose and continue to be looking for the sensations until they do come. And even if even if they're gone for a few breaths and then they come for only a short time, and then they, uh, you can continue to, to practice effectively with that. Do you think these will help you? They sound like they're on... on track for good yes could you speak at all to um, when it becomes appropriate to start meditating on or deconstructing the mental image of the breath itself almost the way you're saying about our emotions and our physical sensations in terms of pain when um, like I'm sure this doesn't just apply to me, that we're so conditioned at Diamond Mountain to meditating on emptiness on emptiness analytically mm-hmm. that I f- feel sometimes like I was stopping myself mm-hmm. from deconstructing how the breath mm-hmm. was happening at all because I was saying, no, just stay with the breath, just stay with the breath. Then my, I found my mind either getting very bored with it or feeling like, again, this is a waste of time. Right. And so when would you say it becomes appropriate to put that little part of the mind that says, oh, the, even this breath is being created by the mind. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I'll, I'll see if I can describe to you what that's like. Uh, through hundreds or thousands of hours of observing the sensations of the breath, they become very, very familiar. Mm-hmm. You know, And, you know, when you look at something that's very familiar. When you see another human body, there you don't have to conceptualize it. Oh, that's the head, and that's the arm, and that's the leg. It, it's just there because of that familiarity. And so naturally, when you look at somebody, instead of uh, doing that kind of conceptualization of the gross parts of the body, 
instead you're focusing in on the much subtler aspects of their appearance. You know, the, the things that are not common to everybody that you've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Right? So you'll find the same thing happening with the breath, that you've observed it so often that the, the no longer needs to be this separate identification of, oh, that's the beginning of the, of the end breath, and, and uh, then whatever sensations you may be aware of as the breath unfolds, and that's the end, and that's the pause, because there's just this immediate recognition of them. You're already on the way to that. To, to what you're talking about. This deconstruction is something, uh, it's interesting, nobody's ever described it as that before, but it's actually uh, a good way to describe it. This deconstruction starts to happen by itself, and then all you need to do is just let it continue to unfold. What's actually happening, and, and you'll become aware of this especially if you do this. What's actually actually happening all the time is there is one part of your mind that is continuously monitoring sensations uh, and another part that's monitoring sounds and so on and so forth. And that part of your mind is presenting certain of those uh, sensations to conscious awareness. Um, and the way that it happens is you usually just kind of sample the sensations. When you first start to meditate on the breath, you're not even consciously aware of most of the sensations that arise in the course of an in-breath and an out-breath. All that happens is, is there's just a sampling in here and there. And then there's another part of your mind that conceptualizes it and says, oh, that's the in-breath. That's, I mean, at, at a subtler level than this, but but the, it conceptualizes air and it conceptualizes air moving in and it conceptualizes that you have a nose. And so you sort of have this whole image that's all a fabrication that arises. And, and as, over time, you focus more and more closely on the sensations themselves, keeping in mind from the very beginning that that's all there really is, is the sensations. And as in your practice, you keep focusing more and more closely on these sensations. The tendency of the mind to do all this conceptualization comes to be less. And that's what I'm talking about when there's that familiarization. So there's a whole lot less conceptualization taking place already. And when you sense that, then you can just sort of allow your focus to just, just go right into the sensations themselves. Just saturate your awareness with the observation of all of that flux of uh, first it's cool and then it becomes warm, first it's moving quickly and then slowly and then uh, and, and it, there's this little hesitation and then it starts up again and you know all the different sensations that make it up and you can just sort of immerse yourself in that awareness. And as you do so, what might happen, you see there's still, uh, if you can continue the deconstruction, because still, cold and warmth and movement, these two, these two are fabrications. And as you get closer and closer to the reality of what's actually being presented to conscious awareness, you know, these raw sensations, it's just a continuous flux. Uh, It becomes almost like a vibration. As a matter of fact, it does become like a, a complex set of vibrations that's just unfolding. And when that happens, you know, you're experiencing the reality of, of, of everything that's ever happened to you. Uh, you'll go through, you'll have an experience where, you know, before you go to this depth, you'll have an experience sometimes where you don't know whether the sensations you're observing are in-breath or out-breath. And you know that it would take such a tiny little movement of your mind to identify them, but you become really aware that it is a separate movement of the mind that identifies those sensations. And so you can resist that happening and just go deeper and deeper into it. So 
you will have, and in this way you can have a direct experience of impermanence. And impermanence doesn't really mean that that nothing lasts. It means that there are no things. There is just only this continuous flux that everything's always changing. And your mind won't like that. When your mind loses its grounding and conceptualization, it'll react against that and immediately jump back to that place of conceptualization. But, you know, you can start moving back and forth between that. And then it becomes really crystal clear that that this is when we say that the that the mind creates reality, you, you're actually seeing it happen. You're seeing that uh, the mind recognizes certain patterns in this flux, and it grasps onto those patterns, and it gives them an identity. It makes them into a thing. It makes something that doesn't have a nature of thingness of its own, but it gives us the attribute of thingness, and now the mind feels comfortable. It can hold on to it. You know that this has an identity, and it can put a label on it. So this is the difference between nama and rupa. Rupa is just that raw sensory information, un- unprocessed, unfabricated, unconceptualized, and nama is that whole process of making it into something that is comprehensible to the mind graspable by the mind, understandable by the mind. And you see that 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 thing that the mind has created, you see what it means to say that it's empty. It's empty of any reality other than that which the mind has projected as as uh, as its explanation, as its way of understanding and interpreting this. And this is going on all of the time. So back to your original question, the, don't force the deconstruction, but when you feel that your mind is no longer doing as much conceptualization as before, that you're in a very relaxed and very clear state, and that you're, you're observing the sensations with a lot less conceptualization than you did in the past, then just allow yourself to continue going in that direction. And, you know, maybe you can move intentionally more in, in, in that direction. So just let it let it unfold and it can lead you to very, very wonderful uh, insights. A direct experience of impermanence and a direct experience of uh, of the uh, the emptiness of the of the appearances that the mind generates to explain phenomena. If you do this for a period of time with the breath, if you can get to this place and you can see, you can just sort of go back and forth between this is the rupa and this is the nama, and, and the nama is is empty of anything except what the mind gives to it. And you start to see breath and everything as, as appearance. If you sit in meditation for a while doing that, and then you get up from meditation and your eyes are open, you realize, my mind's doing that with everything all of the time that it's you know it's it's creating this whole the world is really inside my mind <laughs> and does that answer your question oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's where you want to go with that um, Do you have Do you have more questions? Yeah. yeah. So, follow, um, you know, following up on this, um, is 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 that deconstruction <coughs> part of um, single point of concentration, or or is analysis or or insight that is this a different process? That part of that. Uh, well, you see, when you're developing. <coughs> uh, when you're developing concentration, you can just be focused on the end result and say, I, I want to get the single pointedness as soon as I can. And if you do, you'll miss out on the op- all of the opportunities for insight that are being presented along the way. But, uh, and so you could, you could not perform this deconstruction. You could, you get to that place where there's 
very little conceptualization taking place, and you use it to launch yourself into uh, effortless uh, single-pointedness. Right? And then once you have the effortless single-pointedness and, and you work your way through the, through the, the joy and, and uh, the happiness and the tranquility and equanimity arises, then you can plunge on into the jhanas and the absorption. But it's actually best if you don't. It's best, uh, I believe, that if in the entire process of developing, uh, you're not developing, you're not developing concentration by itself. And I, I so I always try to say these together. In the process of developing concentration and the power of mindful awareness, if in that process you're always coming from the point of that, you're you're allowing yourself to gain insight, understanding. You're, you're, in the, you're, you're seeing what the mind has to teach you at every step of the way. And you, you let that become evident. So if you're doing that, then it, once you have the ability to focus on these sensations in this way, then all you need to do is just let it let it go in the direction that it's, it's already started to go anyway and let it bring you to the kind of discovery and insight that is already there. It's just waiting to be, it's just waiting for you to discover it. Uh, and so don't, just don't ignore it. Allow yourself to learn, you know. Um, from the time you first sit down to meditate, uh, you should be learning more and more every time you sit down about the way your mind works and about the relationship between your mind and reality. It should become very clear to you if you let it, and if somebody has pointed out to you that said that says that all you are as an individual is these uh, five skandhas, these five aggregates. In your meditation, that should become apparent. All there is is uh, sensations, that's form, and feelings, and perceptions, and mental formations, and consciousness. And uh, that should become really evident. And it should also become evident that uh, the totality of the experience is subject to this natural twofold division into uh, the internal and the external mind and matter, mentality and materiality, nama and rupa, and that in any given moment, if you're conscious, you're conscious of something. And what you're conscious of has to be one of those two. It has to be either nama or rupa. It has to be either (coughs) sensation or the mental formations that have arisen Sometimes there are mental formations that have arisen as a direct result of the sensation. You hear sound, and the sound causes the idea of bird, the mental formation of bird, or car, or cough, or something like that to arise. Uh, Other mental formations arise independently of sensation. Some mental formations are in the form of intentions, and so they're followed by sensation and so forth. So just allow these things that are there all the time. You're experiencing them over and over again while you're in meditation. So allow them to make themselves apparent. As you meditate, you should discover very, very clearly the meaning of the five aggregates and the meaning of the statement that says that that collectively these five aggregates do include everything that we can refer to as the individual. And likewise, it should, in your meditation, become clear that your entire life, the totality of your existence, isn't that you have a body that exists and a mind exists, but the, the existence is really grounded in conscious experience. And the totality of your life, of your existence, is a series of conscious experiences <coughs> unfolding. And that each experience is defined by the object that's taken in that moment, and whatever it leads to in the next moment, and the next moment, and the next. 
which of course is the teaching of dependent origination. Right? So all of this is just there waiting to be discovered. Um, let me say something else too. Um, we single pointedness. Um, we use the cultivation of single pointedness as a way of bringing the mind to a state of unification, of developing uh, this very, very powerful attentional stability and of also developing this very powerful mindfulness. But once that's been accomplished, there's no need to continue in single-pointedness. So when you, in terms of the stages of the practice, uh, when you get to the point of effortless single-pointedness, the eighth stage, you can choose to take up a variety of different practices which do not involve single-pointed awareness. You no longer need it. You, your mind is so stable now that instead of staying on a single object, you can allow your mind to go from one object to another to another. And although the period that you're within any object may be very short, you will, the mind will rest firmly and stably on that object and it, the mindfulness will penetrate into that object with all of the same power that you have developed with a single fixed object. And so you, it, when that happens, it's like you're, you're striking to the heart of everything that you notice and it may be a stream of things unfolding. It's unfolding as quickly as the process of sensation and uh, the identification of the sensation and the feeling that that, or, or, or even the sensation and the feeling that that sensation produces. And then the conceptualization, the identification that follows. And then the different feeling that results from your identification of that. You know, your mind can, so you don't, you, in a sense this is still a kind of single pointedness, but it's very rapidly changing. That's, uh, that's called, in the Pali, it's called kanaka samadhi, or momentary samadhi. And it doesn't mean that your concentration is momentary, but the object is momentary. Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can investigate your experience. You can go out and, and do a walking meditation and just allow your attention to spontaneously move and, and just absorb totally whatever it is happening in that. You can choose to practice uh, with no particular object. You can expand your awareness and make it very spacious and uh, just allow whatever happens to arise and pass away. Because your mind now is very, very still. And the essence of doing any kind of Mahamudra practice, which is what this really is, is your mind. You have to be capable of allowing your mind to be totally still as appearances arise within the mind and pass away. And so once you develop effortless single-pointed concentration, then you can do that. Before then, you can't. Your mind just doesn't have the stillness. It's like trying to capture a reflection in water that's disturbed with waves and ripples and everything. It won't happen. But once it becomes completely still, then whatever whatever passes by or whatever is nearby will be reflected perfectly in the water and you can have that kind of, uh, of perception. So single-pointedness is, a, it, I, I think it's the most powerful way. I, I know that there, there are meditation techniques that never use single-pointedness like the shikantaza, the just sitting method of uh, uh, some of the Zen schools and things like that. But single-pointedness appears to be, uh, to me, the most powerful way to bring your mind to unification and stillness and very, very clear awareness. But once you've done that, you're not, you know, single-pointedness in itself, you can either continue to use it, you can practice the jhanas, you can enter into the jhanas, but you can do any other kind of practice as well. So it is not the sine qua non of concentration of, of, of shamatha practice. It is a vehicle.
Yes. So um, what you just described is uh, the single-pointedness. The, the object is steady, but it's unchanging. No, it, it is. It's not necessarily that the object, is, because the sensations of the breath are not uh, unchanging. They continuously change. Although what is very interesting, if you continue in single-pointed practice uh, on the breath, uh, after a while, the entire breath cycle becomes more and more like a single object. And it's, it's no longer unfolding one tiny piece at a time, but it, you have more of, uh, of this full understanding of it. And uh, this is a continuation of our earlier discussion. Um, had, are any of you familiar, do you know what an oscilloscope is? No high school science teacher ever brought out an oscilloscope. It's like a little television screen, and it tracks waveforms. And something that repeats over and over. Everybody has seen You've seen an oscilloscope if you've ever watched a hospital show. The thing that they show EKGs on. And the EKG, this is all the changes that take place in, in one beat, of, in a single beat of the heart. And so on the screen, it might show three heartbeats in a row. And then the fourth heartbeat is back, and it's kind of superimposed on the first one. And the fifth one on the second. And so before the first one has faded away, the fourth one is being superimposed on it. And as long as the heart stays very, very regular, it is virtually unchanging. But when one heartbeat is a little later or earlier than the other one, you might have noticed this, that, that this new trace isn't quite exactly over the top of the last one. It may have a little bit different shape, may start a little earlier or a little later. So you know what I mean now? Okay. In your mind, all of these sensations that are produced by the breath, your, these sensations reverberate in your mind for a certain period of time. As a matter of fact, you could not recognize the sound of a bird call if they didn't, because each part of the sound arises and disappears before the next one comes. So the only way that your mind can grasp the wholeness of something is because it retains what's already passed for a certain period of time. You see what I'm saying here? Mm -hmm. a, a comparison is, you know, a, a melody, twinkle, twinkle, little star. If each note is played with a two-minute gap between, you'll never catch the melody. It has to be close enough together that your mind remembers the last note, at the last few notes before the next one comes, before you can recognize it. Same thing with the sound of a car, uh, a dog barking, a bird singing or something like that, your mind has to retain the parts that are already passed. Same thing with the sensations of your breath. And your mind will retain those impressions uh, long enough so it becomes like like the trace of, of a heartbeat on an uh, oscilloscope in a hospital. That the, fur, the impression of the last breath hasn't completely disappeared before the next one comes in place. And this is something that is entirely taking place in your mind. And so you can, you can shift your attention away from the actual sensations, which is a continuous flux of, of momentary arisings and passings away. You can take your attention and pop it over here to this part of your mind, this preconceptual part of your mind, where the, those impressions are stored. And now the, the cycle of your breath becomes like a single object that you can perceive all at once in its entirety. And so while the breath is a changing object, it can become, it can take on all of the qualities of a, sing, a, a, as a, a stable fixed object. Uh, this, this is a pretty advanced and pretty refined state of concentration when you're able to recognize these mental imprints as distinct from the sensations themselves and redirect your attention from one to the other. But this is a powerful vehicle for entering into the deepest jhanas. And this, this is the other kind of nimitta that I was talking about. This is, this is the one that 
doesn't bother with the illumination and the light and just ignores it. So where was this came from? Somebody asked me something about, because you only do this with a, or are we only talking about single-pointedness with a fixed object? Uh, well, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a constant object. Uh, usually I think we use the term fixed object meaning constant. So the breath is a, a fixed object, but it's also a changing object. Uh, it, it changed moment to moment. One breath is longer or shorter, deeper or shallower, and so on and so forth. So, so you're saying that jhanas would actually be focusing on the unchanging mental image That's of right. breath. That's right. And not following all the fluctuations That's and right. sensations. That's right. You can enter into a light kind of jhana that involves an awareness of bodily sensations and uh, bodily pleasure, things like that. But to enter into the deepest jhanas, the mind has to... Uh, completely withdraw from the senses. Now, when I say deep jhanas, I'm not I'm not meaning uh, five through eight as opposed to one through four. I'm talking about a deep version of the first jhana as opposed to a light version of the first jhana. So the deep jhanas, the are what is definitive of a deep jhana is the mind has completely withdrawn from the sen- from the senses. And in order to do that you need a meditation object which is entirely mental rather than you know than, than sensation because as long as you're in the realm of sensation you're in the realm of sensation <laughs> yeah. oh we we need a nice long retreat. So many things I'd love to tell you about. <laughs> You're asking these these very good questions and uh, is bringing up very good points. But um, alas, we have the time and opportunity we do. We need to make the best of it. So I do want to sit with you. Um, so perhaps there's 34 minutes before the bell rings at nine o'clock. Why don't you take the next four minutes to stretch? I know you've been sitting for a long time, and then we'll sit together for half an hour. Thank you very much for your wonderful question. Mm-hmm.